good to be with you all again. But as you've probably seen from the handouts before you or from the, the email that was sent out um, for the, the next couple of, of weeks or however long uh, this takes, I will be taking a temporary respite from systematic theology and will instead go through a book of the Bible to give us a bit of a breather. And the, the reason I, I wanted to do this is obviously we finished anthropology, and so instead of moving into the next section uh, in systematic theology, um, I thought we should take a break real quick because the next section is homardiology, which is the study of sin. And that section is a, a bit heady as it inevitably requires that we deal with some abstract theories and concepts, but after homardiology is soteriology, which is the study of salvation, and you can uh, imagine how deep down the rabbit hole we can go with that. And so, since sin and salvation are so closely connected, and actually they're inseparable, uh, I don't, I didn't really want to insert a study of the book of the, uh, of the, or a study on the, a book of the Bible between homardiology and soteriology, um, since they, since they kind of build off of one another, and so I wanted to do, just go straight into the study of salvation after we finish the study of sin, uh, but if we do that, of course, then that would mean that we would go through three sections of systematic theology in a row, which would be anthropology, homardiology, and soteriology, which can all be fairly deep studies. And so, because I don't want to be like John Knox and have someone throw a chair at me, um, I decided to go ahead and pause the study in systematic theology now um, and study a book of the Bible to give our minds a bit of a rest and to um, get more into the waters of some practical theology. Um, and then subsequently, we'll move into homardiology, followed immediately by soteriology. Um, but as to the, the book we'll, we'll be studying, you probably also know this as well, but we will be in the book of Jude. And uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but there is actually a book between, the, uh, between 3 John and Revelation. Um, it's the book of Jude. And it's about a page long, <clears throat> and it can be overlooked because most of the time, if you venture that far back in your Bibles, it's probably because you're interested in eschatology or the book of Revelation and trying to validate whether amillennialism is true or not. And, and so Jude just naturally gets skipped over. Um, and So I wanted to go through the book of Jude because it's not studied often. Um, and due to its size, because most studies of books of the Bible in, in churches tend to focus on, on longer books of the Bible, and for very good reason, um, because we want to really study the books with a lot of meat on the bone. Um, but, but that means at times shorter books sometimes don't make the cut. And uh, given how I want to get through systematic theology still, I didn't really want to do a longer book. Um, so I spoke with our pastor for a bit, and he pointed me in a few wise directions and I decided to go through the book of Jude. And so for today, we'll have a, an introduction to the book discussing its author. We'll discuss the author's intention. Um, and then I'll offer a brief summary of the book. And then next time we're together, um, we'll uh, start exegeting the first couple of verses. And so to begin, I'd actually like to read the book in full because there's no chapter divisions, and so there's not a definitive stopping point, and plus the book is small enough that it will not take us long. So I'll read the book out loud if you'll follow along, and so we'll familiarize ourselves with the content, and then I'll discuss all the background information. Um, so if you'll turn to Jude verse 1, and we'll read through the end of the book. <clears throat> Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. 
And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them! For they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loud mouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy without fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times and now and forever. Amen. All right, so a, a very small book, but filled to the brim with uh, intense theological themes, um, particularly too, and uh, those uh, of you who are who are readers or, or enjoy language, you probably caught how many literary devices are, are in this letter and how much uh, how skilled Jude seems to be with invective uh, in talking about these uh, charlatans who have kind of entered into the church, talking about how they're waterless clouds, fruitless trees in late autumn, and wild waves of the sea all in wandering stars, all these kinds of devices and metaphors that he's throwing in there. Um, it's a very interesting uh, read from a literary standpoint as well. So Jude is clearly an, an intelligent individual. But, but that's it. So that's the whole book. And so we'll, to start, let's talk exa about exactly who wrote this book, and we'll spend a good amount of time on this, um, because, there, uh, of course, we, we're told who the name is. So if we go to verse 1, the name of the author is quite clear. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now, the reason uh, validating who this author is, the reason this is difficult, is because there's approximately eight different Judes in the New Testament. Um, that are at least mentioned. So you have eight Judes to pick from. Uh, the other thing to remember is that, and I'll touch on this again later on, but um, Jude and Judas are interchangeable in the way in the naming convention. So in the English translation, Judas is generally translated as Jude, but in the actual Greek text, there is no distinction between the name Judas and Jude. Um, and so even as you read through this in the, in the New Testament or in the Greek, you'll see that there is no distinction between how those names are spelled. And so again, you, you have several different Judes that you can pick from here. Um, however, 
we now, so we know the name of the author, but we have to figure out who this Jude is. Um, we get a slight description, a more helpful description in the next phrase. Um, he says, which is a servant of Jesus Christ. That helps narrow it maybe just a smidgen, um, because we know that, <clears throat> then that Jude is a Christian. And the fact that he is writing this kind of book, particularly in light of what we've just read, tells us that his devotion to the Christian faith and his knowledge of the Christian faith is quite extensive, um, especially given the Old Testament allusions and Jewish references that he's using. And so this writer is not just some random individual named Jude, nor even merely a Christian named Jude, but he is someone who possesses a rather impressive knowledge of Christianity in general and Old Testament literature and Old Testament themes in particular. But in the next phrase, uh, in the verse though, we have a little bit more help, which because he gives a rather interesting point. He states that he is the brother of James, the brother of James. And so obviously uh, there are, again, many people named James, but Jude does not provide any description of this James. There is no qualification here. He just says brother of James. It is assumed then that the audience to whom Jude is writing is quite aware of who James is. Therefore, the James whom Jude is a brother of must be quite a notable fellow. And so you have several Jameses in the scriptures and you have several Judes in the scriptures. And so the, the trying to figure out and pinpoint who this Jude is can be a little bit of a challenge. Um, but for efficiency, because you have less uh, people named James than you do Jude, um, it's usually better to try to figure out who this James is that Jude is the brother of, and then that will give you a little more insight into who uh, Jude actually is. Um, and so we'll talk about the different people named James in Scripture, uh, starting with the apostles, and we'll move from there. But there, there's two important characters named James in the New Testament, and they are imp- apostles. So you have James, the son of Zebedee, who is the brother of the apostle John, and then you have James, the son of Alphaeus. Now, James, the son of Zebedee, was martyred by Herod, and and this is an important point because this occurs early in church history. Um, It occurs early before all of these various missionary journeys start taking place and and before a lot of the epistle, uh, more of the epistles are written. Um, And so James, the son of Zebedee, Um, In Acts chapter 12, verse 1, you'll see that reference. And it says, About the time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And this martyrdom combined with being brothers with John would certainly make James, son of Zebedee, a well-known figure, And so it's possible that just mentioning the name James here would be enough for Jude's audience to know who he is. So, I mean, it's not a bad contender for the James Jude is referring to. It's certainly a possibility. The second apostle named James is James, the son of Alphaeus. Now, he was just as significant as the other apostles, but he's something of a contrast to James, the son of Zebedee, because this James is seldom mentioned in the gospel accounts. He's a rather obscure man, And this may be why he did not see fit to write a book of the Bible or to place himself in the spotlight as much as the other apostles did. Because James, uh, because of James, son of Alphaeus' obscurity and because he did not play a publicly prominent role uh, in Jesus' ministry, it's quite possible that this James is not well known. And so if this is the James that Jude is referencing, then you would think that there would likely need to be a description of him or some kind of qualifier. Um, so therefore, Jude is likely not referring to uh, the brother, or is likely not the brother of James, son of Alphaeus. Um, now, the, the other flip side that we probably need to make here is that when Jude is describing James, he does not say that James is an apostle. And this is important because, um, now it doesn't necessarily mean that James is not an apostle, But the fact that Jude does not add that description to James is peculiar, especially when we consider that in their writings and in their public ministries, the apostles frequently reference their apostolic authority to reinforce their credibility. 
Because if James, uh, if Jude's brother James is an apostle, then why doesn't Jude say so? The biblical writers must have credibility because they're literally writing scripture. So it is important that their audience understand that. And it's important that their writings are persuasive. And so generally what they do is they cite their status or role as apostle or provide some description about themselves so their audience actually listens to them. Paul does this all the time. He frequently cites that he is an apostle and frequently goes to his apostolic authority or roots his persuasiveness and his rhetoric in his apostolic authority. That way his audience will actually listen to him. And the book of Jude, as, we, as we've just read, and you, you noticed that the book of Jude is largely an appeal. Jude is imploring, he is almost begging and contending with his, with his audience to deal with these charlatans, to deal with this false doctrine, to not walk in uh, the false doctrine that's being, that's being dispersed here. And so the book of Jude is largely an appeal, which means the goal is to persuade. And so it should be expected that if James were an apostle, that Jude would at least reference his apostleship in order to gain some credibility for himself and therefore be more persuasive. However, Jude doesn't do that. So at least in my mind, that leads me to think that the reason Jude does not reinforce James' apostleship is because the James he is referencing is not actually an apostle. But now that we've talked about those, and now we have that out of the way, and we talked about the two apostles named James, let's talk about another James in the New Testament who is not an apostle. And so now turn with me to Acts chapter 12, verse 16. This is after the the martyrdom of James, son of Zebedee, and this is after Peter gets arrested in conjunction with that event, and now Peter has escaped prison. And so this occurs after Peter is escaping from prison, and then after he escapes, he goes to Mary's house, the mother of John, uh, and then he knocks to be left in, or let in. And so in verse 16, we're told, but Peter continued knocking, And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. Now in verse 17, we see that Peter mentions James by name. And it is interesting that he separates James from the brothers. He doesn't say, tell the brothers. He says, tell James and the brothers. And so he's separating James from the other apostles, which indicates that this James is not an apostle. He is not part of the brothers. And Peter here is drawing a distinction between the apostles and this James he is referencing. And then, of course, of note is that he mentions James's names first. And then the apostles, he doesn't say tell the brothers and James, rather he says James and the apostles, which could be an indication of the significance of James's role in Jerusalem. And so this James is not an apostle, but he is significant because Peter feels the need to tell James of these events. Now this James could fit the bill of this James that Jude is referencing. So this, because again, Jude is probably referencing a James who is significant, but not an apostle. And so far, this James seems to fit this description. But this James is actually spoken of a bit more. So now flip to Acts chapter 15, verse 12. And we will read this through verse 19. So this is the Jerusalem council. And this is after some of the this is after some of the missionary efforts and the evangelistic efforts and and the main context of this event is uh, this debate or conversation about whether or not Gentiles should be saved or can be saved and what kind of implications that has to the Christian church and to the evangelistic ministry. And so the, after they're, they're turning, they're talking about all of these events and they're talking about all of these things and hearing everybody's cases. And this is where this picks up in verse 12. And so in verse 12, we're told, And all the assembly fell silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. 
Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophet agree, prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what they have and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogue. And I'll end that there. But as we know, the story goes, that is exactly what they did. They followed exactly what James had specified here. They had sent the letter. They had dispersed this information to uh, encourage alignment between the various Christian churches in those regions so that they were spreading this word that the Gentiles could receive salvation. And so they were going after, they were following and abiding by what James had specified here. And of note, the James mentioned here cannot be James the Apostle, son of Zebedee, because James the Apostle was martyred in Acts chapter 12. So this is a totally different James, and must be the James that Peter references in Acts chapter 12. And of note as well, is that this James doesn't merely take a prominent role of the Jerusalem Council, but rather it seems that almost as if he is the leader of the Jerusalem Council, as he is speaking with finality and surety. So he is a man who has a rather significant role, which matches the same description of James that Paul provides in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, when he calls James a pillar of the church. So this James is not an apostle, but he's listed as a pillar of the church and is also referenced as an elder in the Jerusalem church. So he has very high titles. And as such, he seems to be important enough that someone would know who he is without a description. And as we just as, as we see here, even the apostles listened to him from this Jerusalem council. So he has some level of significant credibility. And so that does seem to match the James that Jude may be referencing here. And at this point, um, you're probably thinking, well, you're talking an awfully a lot about James for a book that's written by a person named Jude. Well... <laughs> Well, the reason, again, that affirming the identity of James is important is because, again, there are so many Judes referenced in the, Old Te in the New Testament. And so by pinpointing who James is, this James is, we can pinpoint who Jude is. And since there are fewer people named James, it's more efficient to identify who this James is. And if we go with this James of the Jerusalem Council, then it becomes even more significant because this James is actually the brother of Jesus. And so now if you'll flip over or flip back to Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, we'll see a little bit uh, of this. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 55. And uh, we see uh, it says the crowd in the synagogue marvels at Jesus' knowledge and says, is, this, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So now we have a list of Jesus' brothers. And then, if um, you don't have to, to flip here, but in Galatians 1.19, Paul says that he saw James, the brother of Jesus. So we know by the time Galatians is written that James is still around. We know that James, the brother of Jesus, is still around. And then Paul goes on to call James, the brother of Jesus, the pillar of, a pillar of the church. In Galatians 2, uh, verse 9. So this same James, uh, who Peter references in Acts chapter 12, is an elder in the Jerusalem church, called a pillar of the church, and is also the brother of Jesus. And so at that point, you don't really need to have apostleship to have credibility. Because being the brother of Jesus is probably enough to, to give you some level of notoriety. In addition, of course, to the other prominent roles that James still had. And so in this context, it makes complete sense why Jude doesn't reference James' apostleship or even anything else about James. Because he's not an apostle, he's Jesus' brother. And as you could have guessed, since James is Jesus' brother, 
that also means that Jude is Jesus' brother. And this makes sense, again, if you go back to Matthew 13, 55 that we just read, where we're told that Jesus has four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And again, in the Greek text, Jude is actually spelled out as Judas. So Jude is something of an English variant of Judas, and Jude and Judas are the same name. And so, and the Greek spelling of Judas in Matthew 13, 55 is the same as the Greek spelling as Jude in Jude, verse 1. And the name and same spelling of, as the name of the book of Jude, etc. And so Judas and Jude are interchangeable as they're spelled the exact same way in the Greek scriptures, but you just don't see that in the English translation, and so you can kind of get thrown off a bit. So when you're reading in English, they seem like they're two different people, but they're actually the same person. That was James that was. Brother. Yep. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's significant because he's there. you can see the apostles are somewhat of yielding to his decision at the council. I mean, they certainly, not that they disagreed with the decision, but they still went with the practical applications about writing a letter and in the, in the disbursement of the communications. So um, even on those practical things. So it seems that um, he was the leader of the Jerusalem church, which is probably why everyone was deferring to his leadership because it was kind of his jurisdiction. Yes. They were not. No. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yep, so the, this one, it's more of a, a sent one or disciple as well. So they're putting him on the same level just about because of his prominence. Right. Original. Uh, there were two apostles named James. Son of Zebedee, son of Alphaeus. Yes, very, very popular name. John, James. Yeah, the you have all the J's there. The Johns, the James, the Judas, the Judes. Just, and, and it's even worse if they don't have last names back then, so you have to kind of just figure it out based on context clues and family lineage. Um, but, but yeah, to, to, to go back, so um, Judas and uh, Jude are interchangeable, but... Uh, so again, to condense this, this line of reasoning, um, Jude references that he is the brother of James, a fellow who is likely not an apostle, but is significant enough to be known without a description. And there's only really one James in the New Testament that fits that bill, which is James, the brother of Jesus. And since Jude is the brother of James, this means that the author of the book of Jude is Jude, uh, the brother of Jesus. And uh, like our pastor was saying, this is fascinating when we consider the fact that Jesus' own family did not believe that he was the Messiah before his resurrection. Um, we are, um, but after Jesus was resurrected, we are told that he appeared to his brother James. And we know that James then believed. So it's, it's interesting that you have James and, and presumably Jude as well, that you have Jesus' family really rebelling against his messiahship and you have to kind of put yourself in those shoes and imagine how difficult that would be like here's a, a guy you've grown up with as your brother and all of a sudden he he hits a certain age and now he starts saying he's the messiah i mean that's got to be a, a difficult position to be in 
um, when you've grown up with them, when you've been friends, when you've been family and you've, uh, and you've known them their entire life. And now all of a sudden you, they start having this ministry. And so Jesus was shunned by his own brothers. But after he was resurrected, Jesus makes a very specific point to reveal himself to James, to go back there to James and, and talk to him. And, uh, and so James, we're told, believes after that. And so the same is probably true of Jude. We're not given a description of this and of this conversion in Scripture, but we know that Jude eventually does convert and that he eventually does believe in, uh, in uh, Jesus Christ for redemption of sins because he's writing this epistle here. And so it's probably the exact same way. So you have these James and Jude who have been rebellious and who have denied Christ their entire life. And then Christ is resurrected and now they believe in him. And then they move up in kind of the, these upper echelons of the church. As in uh, James now takes an extraordinarily prominent role in Jerusalem, the central hub. And so does, uh, and we see Jude as well with this very adept knowledge of the Christian faith. Um, and specifically of the Old Testament. And so Jude's adept knowledge of the Old Testament and Jewish literary sources make complete sense when we view him as someone who is the brother of Christ, as someone who grew up in that Jewish community and whose other brother was a member of the Jerusalem Council and the Jerusalem Church. And it's also possible because of that that Jude was also a member of that church. And so, so now we, we know, or at least think we know, or at least I think that I know who wrote the book of Jude. Um, so now we should talk about why. And as we read through it, we see that apparently uh, Jude had every intention to write to his recipients about their common salvation, as he specifies in Jude verse 3. Um, so he says, like, essentially, I was going to write to you about salvation and about the the riches that we share in, in the kingdom of heaven, et cetera, et cetera. But he's unable to do this due to what he describes as theological charlatans sneaking their way into the church congregation. And so to Jude, addressing the influx of the charlatans and the doctrine they are dispersing is more important than his original purpose of writing this. And so consequently, he turns his attention to calling his audience to action on either removing these people from their midst or converting them back to the right theological path. And so this then becomes the why of Jude. He spells it out for us quite nicely. In verse 3, he states that he finds it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. And as such, the purpose of the book of Jude is an appeal to contend for the faith. The book then is an appeal. Now, in terms of the audience to whom Jude is writing, um, he, he doesn't give us a specific demographic, a specific location, a, a specific um, geography, <laughs> nothing like that. But in verse 1, he calls them the called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. So, uh, so outside of the, we know that they're Christians he's writing to, so it's probably a church. Um, but of course, this is quite broad, so it's unclear to whom exactly he is writing. Um, however, as mentioned already, Jude uses multiple references to the Old Testament and even references Jewish literature like the Pseudepigrapha and some non-canonical sources, and we'll talk about those later, um, but like the Book of Enoch. But generally, these references would only be persuasive for a Jewish audience. A Gentile audience wouldn't really care about these kinds of references. Um, and so it makes sense then that his audience is composed primarily of Jews. As such, it is likely that Jude's audience is predominantly Jewish. And it, it's possible because of that that he could be writing to the Jerusalem church. And that may make some sense since his brother uh, James had a strong presence there already. So the church would have been known to Jude and Jude would have known the church and they would have known Jude, etc. But of course, one counterpoint to that is if James were leading the Jerusalem church, then why would charlatans even have snuck in there? And why do they even pose a legitimate threat under James's leadership? Um, but certainly, the identity of Jude's audience is not conclusive. But fortunately, the identity of his audience is not relevant to the truth that is within Jude's writings. 
But speaking of Jude's writings, that brings to the next point, which is what the book of Jude is, as in what genre of literature. Is it a poem? Is it a book? Is it a dissertation? Is it a letter? Um, but given the size of it, it's fairly evident that this is a letter, particularly if you observe the opening and the ending remarks. In his introduction, he identifies himself. He mentions his audience. He also provides the reason for why he is writing. Um, and then in Jude verse 24, he has a closing benediction, which is customary for letters. And it's also apparent that Jude is sending this somewhere since there is an audience he, he has in mind. And so what the, these points mean that the writing of Jude is an epistle. It, it's a letter and places it within the epistolary literature of the New Testament. And with that, I'll, I'll kind of give a brief summary of, of the book of Jude to, to kind of um, summarize exactly what the themes are. Um, but one interesting thing is I think the, the book of Jude is quite fascinating um, in that he decided to devote an entire epistle to an appeal to contend for the faith and calling out the false teachers who threatened to divide the local and universal church. This makes Jude unique among the other epistles because um, it's true, you can probably give a single unified purpose for each of the individual epistles, as in you can probably give a single reason about why each epistle uh, was written. Um, however, each of the epistles address multiple items instead of just one item. Um, Jude, however, is unique because while most of the epistles, if not all of them, deal with false doctrine in some form or capacity, Jude really has this as his singular focus and doesn't deviate from this. Um, because Jude, uh, in verse 3 and 4, Jude explains the purpose for his writing, which is appeal for contend for the faith. And he doesn't talk about anything else. He, his main focus through this entire epistle is contending for the faith and persuading his audience to stay true to the doctrine that has been handed down to them once and for all from the saints. He doesn't go into any other subject, which is unique for any kind of epistle. And then, um, so in verses 3 through 4, he explains the purpose for his writing. But then in verses 5 through 7, he reminds his audience what occurs to those who turn away from the true faith. Um, because as we know, the Old Testament, unfortunately and fortunately, is full of these examples of what happens when people turn from the faith. He reminds his audience what occurs. So he cites the destruction of the land of Egypt um, for those who rebelled against God. And he cites the punishment of angels who rebelled against God. He compares false teachers to those people who were destroyed or punished by God, and then he lumps in these false teachers in with the likes of Cain. Those who, and then he also lumps them in with those who rebelled against God's leadership under Korah and were swallowed up by the ground. So just like these false teachers are rebelling against God, the false teachers arose in the ranks of the Israelites under Moses' leadership and rebelled against Moses and ultimately rebelled against God's authority. And so they received the physical punishment and consequence and then spiritual consequence for that rebellion. So he's reminding them what happens when you rebel against the living God. And then later, he uses literary devices of metaphor and compares the false teachers to clouds without water as shepherds who feed themselves instead of feeding their own sheep. And, and I love that metaphor because it's so, uh, it's so palpable and poignant. It's, you have these, this shepherd whose literal job, based on the name, is to take care of sheep. It is to look after sheep, it is to protect the sheep, it is to provide for the sheep. But instead of feeding the sheep and taking care of the sheep, the shepherd is just feeding themselves while the sheep are starving in the background or while the sheep are being um, eaten alive by wolves. And so it's like the shepherd, you have one job and it's to take care of the sheep. And yet you're not doing that job. Instead, you're taking care of yourself. And I think that's such a phenomenal analogy or, or metaphor rather for what false teachers do because the name pastor is rooted in the word for shepherd. And so you have the pastor whose job is to take care of the sheep, and instead the only thing he's doing is taking care of himself. 
and he's only feeding himself spiritually, or not even spiritually, but he's even manipulating the congregation. He's feeding false doctrine. He's actually hurting the sheep and not just, um, and not just being apathetic towards them, but he is actively and directly hurting them as well. So it's a phenomenal metaphor here that, that Jude is using. He also compares them to um, fruitless, tree, <coughs> fruitless trees and wild waves. And then in verses 17 through 22, <clears throat> he reminds his audience that Jesus told his followers that false teachers would come and try to spread false doctrine, essentially telling them that they are falling for the very thing that Jesus warned them against and that Jesus foretold. And this has some painful um, this is some painful reminders um, because this, this is not unlike how Peter denied Jesus after Jesus told him that he would. So it's such is the nature of the human heart that even in awareness of the sinfulness of sin is not enough to prevent us from committing that sin. We may know what sin is. We may, and as Christians, we know it. We know the, the wickedness and the evil of sin, the consequences of sin. We know the implications of sin and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, and yet we still sin. And so even this awareness of sin is not enough to prevent us from committing that sin. Peter knows that all too well. And now this audience that Jude is talking to knows this all too well. Because Jesus and many other prophecies told them specifically that false teachers would arise and try to teach this false doctrine. And yet they're falling for this very thing they were warned against. And so this scenario that Jude mentions serves as a reminder that it is only by the Spirit that sin and false doctrine may be resisted. And so an avoidance of sin and false doctrine can only be achieved if we are walking by the Spirit. And not just walking by the Spirit weekly, Sunday to Sunday, but daily and hourly and every second. And then one last significant point that Jude makes, though, and, and I quite like this, is that in verse 22... After everything that Jude just got done saying about false teachers, and he had a litany of things to say about false teachers, but after everything he just got done saying, after all those crazy things he said about them, and after all those Old Testament allusions and metaphors and warnings, in verse 22 he says something so profound, and he says, And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy without fear. So he does not call the church to be cruel to those who doubt God or to those who are led by this false doctrine. Instead, he calls the church to have mercy on these people and to snatch them out of the fire. He calls on them not to make fun of those who follow false doctrine, not to belittle them, not to make them feel stupid, and not to call them names, but instead to show them mercy and to preach the true gospel to them and to love them. And I think this is an important reminder for us in this age in which we live because in our age today there is so much hatred and anger and animosity. There's just anger and rage everywhere, even in the Christian church and even among those who call out false doctrine. And, and I'm speaking to myself first here because I, I used to be one of those social media theology warriors who loved online debates and loved to belittle people. But one of my big pet peeves now are all of these discernment blogs that exist that call out false teachers but are so callous and condescending and cruel in how they do it. Because they do it all under the guise of love for the church, but this love for the church they claim to have is often just a justification they use to hate their enemies and to puff their own selves up instead of showing love to them. And so an important point that Jude reminds us is that while false teachers and those who follow them may reside in the church and, may, and we do need to drive them out and we do need to combat it, we must not forget nor forsake the fruit of the Spirit in our efforts to do so. We must not forget to show mercy. We must not forget to show love or compassion and how we treat them. And we are to be bold, certainly. And like Jude says, we are to be fearless, certainly. But we are also to be merciful and loving in how we call out false teachers and how we help those who are being led by them. And as Spurgeon says, and probably the 30th time I've quoted this up here, but the cross is an offense to the world. 
let us take heed not to add any of our own offense with it. And so the gospel is a sword. It causes enough pain to the soul all on its own. It doesn't need our help. The gospel is a lion. A lion doesn't need help. And to quote Spurgeon again, you don't have to help a lion. All you have to do is just let it loose. And the lion will do its job just fine. It doesn't need you. So the overall lesson of Jude is to be mindful of those who teach false doctrine and to combat them and assist those who fall victim to them, but also to do so with mercy and love for Christ. And I'll end that there for today. And then next time we're together, we'll start um, going through the first couple of verses. But I'll close us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, how we love you and we thank you for these, these precious books. While they may be small in size, you have, by the power of your spirit, you have filled them to the brim with rich theology and practical helps and reminders for your church that have come hundreds and hundreds of years after the fact that we can still benefit from tremendously. And so, Father, I ask that you bless this study of Jude that we're about to, to partake. I ask that you help this to be fruitful and that you help us to find this rich with practical application and that you help this to encourage us in our Christian walks and that you allow this to be a tool used to combat our fleshly desires and to further mortify our sins and to further sanctify ourselves and to give us a greater and deeper love for you and for your church. And Father, I ask that you bless this time of worship that we are about to embark on. I ask that you I ask that you embolden our hearts and that you calm our minds. I ask that you give us focus and clarity of thought. And I ask that you bless us and you continue to sanctify us and you stir our affections for you. And that we may leave here with a greater longing and desire for you and a greater longing to obey your word and to shirk disobedience. And we pray these things in the name of your son. Amen.